Hallelujah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Uncle Eba. Man, it has been good. It has been good spending time with you guys here. I have really enjoyed it. And thank you so much to Brother Isaac for inviting me to be part of the team. And uh, Sister Nelin for hosting us so well. Thank you so much. I want to honor and thank uh, Sister Lungi. Man, we, we have seen, I have seen what's happening here and it's amazing. This is the doing of the Lord and it's uh, marvelous in, in my eyes at least. It is marvelous. So thank you for all that you are doing here. And sister, let me tell you a full name. A full name is Ndombi Zamazizi. Thank you so much, sister. <laughs> well, I say this because in Zimbabwe we've got Ndombi Zodwa. So anyway, thank you so much for all that you are doing, guys, here. And uh, man, it's awesome. It's awesome. It's great to see you. I don't think I've ever ministered to such a large crowd. I don't think so. And of course, welcome to those watching online. So, uh, as you heard, yes, my name is Keith, and I've had the privilege of uh, being part of the ministry in Zimbabwe for the past 10 years. And indeed, Keris is one of the best things that will ever happen in your life. Yes, you might have been watching Andrew on TV for years, but when you come to Keris, you, you, you get to hear Arthur, and not in just 50 minutes but the whole eight hours where he gets to explain everything in full that he is teaching. And also the other teachers, Barry Bennett, Wen Rupa. Like what Brother Isaac normally says, that there is no place on earth where you find a balanced set of teachings. And I tell you, it will bless you. My testimony is I went to Russia uh, in 2004, and I went to do to study a degree in undergrad, but while I was there, I came across Keris Bible College. And my life was forever changed. I came back in Zimbabwe 2009, and the Lord had placed on our hearts to start the Bible College. And yes, we've seen change, I mean, lives being transformed by the Word of God. Personally, for me, it was really an issue. One of the greatest things that I got from Keris is just. A correct understanding of the word of God. You know, the Bible is, is, is our sacred book. Amen. We honor and revere the book. But if you don't understand the purpose of something, you are most likely to abuse it, to misuse it. And you know, there's another word. But something, you, 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 you misuse the thing. And I have seen a lot of error in the church that has come from a misunderstanding of the Bible. And... Uh, after I got to understand it, this has become my passion, just to help people better understand the Bible. I believe if we understand our source material, we can fix our teaching. And if we've got right teaching, that leads to right believing, which then leads to what? To right living. But it starts with the teaching. Our Bible is correct. It's all right. It's correct. If we read it for what it says, if we let it interpret, interpret itself, it's okay. But if we have a skewed understanding of it, man, we cause problems. So I, I hope you will hear what I'm going to be sharing with you, the things that the Lord has uh, revealed to me. And again, uh, I'm going to be teaching from the letter written to the Hebrews. That's what's going to be my focus. And uh, the real reason why I started studying it is because one day I was watching Andrew on TV. He's got an awesome teaching called Hebrew Highlights. And uh, in that teaching, he says, if Romans and Galatians and Hebrews are not some of your favorite books in the Bible, or at least in the top ten, I doubt that you fully understand the grace of God. So when you say that, it got me thinking. So in first year, we've got a course on Romans by Lawson. We also have got a course on Galatians by Barry. But we didn't have a teaching on Hebrews. So that's, that is what led me then to start studying. And uh, man, the things that have come out of that have really blessed me. So hopefully, these are some of the things I will teach uh, this afternoon. Now, what, what makes Hebrews to be a special letter is this. It was written to the Hebrews, or to the Jews in other words. Now, the Jews, who are the Jews? The Jews are the people who had relationship with God in the, in the Old Covenant. 
These are the people to whom God had revealed himself. Romans chapter 3 verse number 2 says, the advantage of a Jew is that to them were given the oracles of God. Amen? So these are people who knew the stories of Moses, David, and all those other guys. They had the revelation of God. Unlike most of us Gentiles, we had no relationship with God. So Hebrews becomes important in the sense that this is a letter written to explain, or I could even say conclude, the Old Testament to people. So if you have ever read the Old Testament, you need Hebrews to fully understand and appreciate what was being talked about in the Old Testament. And said to say, in most cases, people have missed the point. They have missed the point of what was being discussed in, uh, in the Old Testament. And uh, they've brought in a mix of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, and that creates problems. And when you come to Kerry's Bible College, these things will be sorted out. When you come to Kerry, it's like what most people say, dear. Number one, you get to see the true nature of God. And again, trying to, to balance the Old and the New Testament is created a skewed and an incorrect picture of who God really is. But that one will be sorted. And number two, the other thing that you get to know is what he says about you. Amen? What God really says about you. Not what other people are saying about you or what you think about yourself. So, let's um, look at something here. Uh, I normally give an analogy here, just to help people understand what we are talking about when you are holding the Bible. I want you to understand and appreciate the Bible that you hold in your hands. Now, uh, anyone in movie making, anyone who's got some experience in movie making or producing movies, one hand there. Hallelujah. All right, we'll work with one hand for now. I'll make it very simple. After this, most of you will get it. So in movie making, there are basically three main stages when you're making a movie. There's what they call the pre-production before you produce this thing. Pre-production. And this is the planning stage, right? Where you plan things. And normally in that stage, you get what we call a script. And a script is there to give you guidelines of saying, who are our actors? What are they going to say? How is the movie going to roll out? Yeah. Amen? Then after the pre-production, the second stage is called the production. This is where they actually shoot the movie. Basing on what? The script. Basing on what they've agreed to be, what's going to be taking place in the movie. Then after that, you've got what they call the post-production, where they do the editing and the packaging and, you know, adding some effects there. And that is the same with the Bible that you hold. It, you can break it down into three stages. The pre-production, where we talk of the script, is where you find what the Bible defines as scriptures. Amen? Script, scriptures. Can you see the vibe? Script, the way it's, it's, it's talking of written, the writings, the sacred writings, those are the scriptures. Amen? And that is a script. That is what you find in the Bible. And if you correctly read the Bible, every verse that you find in your Bible mentioning the scriptures, it's referring to Genesis to Malachi. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? So, the script is there. And guess what? There is a main actor in this movie. And that main actor is not you. <laughs> Amen? This script is for a certain main actor. And it's not you. And the error of the church is that people have tried to go into the scriptures to try and identify themselves with the scriptures. And that's where the problem is. The 10 days, the 21 days. I used to think, 21 days, why 21 days? Why not 20 days? It's because they are trying to identify themselves with Daniel. <laughs> Daniel 21 day fast. So anyway, and even I'm glad you said you didn't go to 40 days. 40 days is Moses and Jesus. There's no way when the Bible even says for fast for 40 days. For what? Why 40 days? Anyway, come back. So anyway, the Old Testament is a script, right? It's a script about Jesus. 
in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he comes on the scene and he plays according to the script. Amen? It wasn't by chance that he was born in Bethlehem. Micah said it. It was in the script. It wasn't by chance that he was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Oh, my Lord. Hold on. It wasn't by chance that he was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah mentioned it. Amen? And you can go on and on and on about this. So the scriptures we're talking about Jesus, and I'll show you in a minute this from the Bible. It's not just an analogy which sounds nice, but there's got no evidence. <laughs> then after now, after, the, after the, the Gospels, after Jesus died and rose, we find predominantly, we've got the book of Acts, we'll leave it for now, but predominantly you find what we call the epistles, the letters that the apostles wrote, Apostle Paul, Apostle Peter, Apostle John, Apostle Jude and James, those are the epistles, the letters now, which were written. Now, look at this. Those letters were written to the church. It could have been a church in Galatia, or a church in Rome, or a church in Ephesus. But they were written to the church. And you and me are believers, meaning we are the church. That is where you find yourself. Not in the scriptures, please. Amen? Now, let's go to the Bible. John chapter 5, John chapter 5, verse number 39. John chapter 5, verse number 39. Let's see what it says. This is Jesus speaking, by the way. Amen? Yes, he says, you search the scriptures. Again, the scriptures are Genesis to Malachi. You are busy searching the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. You think if I can fast... For 21 days like Daniel, hopefully God can answer my prayer. Or if I can do all of these things that you find in Genesis to Malachi. In Zimbabwe, altars are big. People are, you, you are told, go and raise an altar in your house. And it's because it's somewhere there in the scriptures. And you can go on and on and on about these things. But he says, you search these scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. Right? And these, these scriptures are they which testify of me. This is Jesus speaking. They are, he's saying in other words, they are not talking about you. They are talking about me. These scriptures. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> All right. Uh, Bible versions, I see the NKJV. Do we have the... Do you have the message version for the Bible there? Is there? Oh, good. If the message version can come out, we would appreciate. Yeah, boy, yes. It says, you have your heads in your Bibles constantly. Again, it's scriptures there, right? Because you think you'll find eternal life there. But you miss the forest for the trees. You're busy focusing on this one tree, and you miss the big picture of the whole forest. These scriptures are all, come on now, they are all about me. Huh? They are all about me. And here I am standing right before you, and you are not willing to receive from me the life you say you want. So the things that you are seeking, they are found from Jesus, right? Whatever you think you, you can get by going and practicing certain things in the scriptures, Jesus says, just come to me. I'll give it, for you. I'll give it to you for free. Hallelujah. You know, there is a sad story. Uh, in Zimbabwe, there was a prominent lady in the one church uh, organization, and she lived in the Mutare area. That woman fasted for one full year, 365 days. She would live on a cup of tea a day. And she literally destroyed the body. The doctors told her, look, your lungs are useless now. You're going to die. And, and the thing is, we had uh, some of our students who knew her, who went to visit her. And when they went to, the vi to visit her at her home now when she was sick, you know, it's courtesy. People would try to offer you a drink or something. And you say, no, I'm okay. She would say, what? Are you, are you fasting? Quickly, quickly, eat something. Please don't fast. She was now advocating for that because now she had destroyed herself. And she didn't live long, she died.
But before she died, she says, the Lord said to her, Judy, what is it that you were fasting for that I would not have given you had you not fasted? And the challenge with legalism is never enough. Imagine, in the Bible, the longest is probably Moses who went for about 80 days. Why would you go for 365? And she's not the only one. There are a couple of pastors we know who've died of this thing. But the thing is, Jesus is saying, the scriptures were talking about me. Amen? If you want to discover yourself, go and read the epistles. That's where you will find who you are. Amen? In simple terms, God did a plan. And Ephesians 3, Ephesians will talk about this. God did a plan. And he made sure that this plan would be executed by Jesus. That's why he prophesied about Jesus in the Old Testament. When he comes, he fulfilled the plan. And now, because of what Jesus has done, because he died and rose, that's why now Ephesians say, we also died and rose with him. We didn't have to go through what he went through and the things that were prophesied about him in the scriptures. Amen? So this is what Jesus said. Amen? Now, um, let's look at what Peter said about this. Acts chapter 3, we can go back to the New King James. Acts chapter 3, verse 22 to 24. Then we'll move on this one. In Acts chapter 3, we find Peter preaching. And this is how the Lord presented to me. He said to me, what did Peter have to say about Moses? Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. It's a lot. And we are saying, out of all those five, five books, first five books of the Bible, what did Peter conclude about Moses? If you were asked to summarize the words of the, f- the very first five books of the Bible, what would you conclude? This is what Peter had to say. For Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him shall you hear in all things whatever he says to you. This is the summary of the first five books of Moses. This is what Moses said in all those first five books. This is, this is what Peter came out with. That what, what Moses was trying to say all along is that one day he would raise a prophet for you. And you must listen to that prophet. In actual sense, well, in actual sense, he's trying to say there will come a time when you will stop listening to me and you start listening to this prophet. And that prophet is Jesus. Amen? And this is the trust that we'll see in the book of Hebrews. So that's where we want to go. Uh, again, Hebrews was uh, written to the Jews. These were the ones with the scriptures. And we are going to see how the scriptures were talking about Jesus. And uh, again, as I mentioned, so our focus becomes the epistles. Now, before we go there, before we go to Hebrews, let's quickly look at John chapter 16. Because some people say, well, I'm that kind of guy who reads the red letters, you know. The red letters of Jesus. I want to hear what Jesus said. <laughs> you are laughing. There is a prominent man of God in Zimbabwe who said, look, our message is the gospel. And that's true. And you find the gospel in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the Acts. The letters, they're just letters. Forget them. And I'm thinking, what? Forget the letters. That's where we find our identity. So, John chapter... John chapter 16, John chapter 16. Let's look at what John chapter 16 says. Again, this is Jesus speaking. Verse number 12, sorry. John chapter 16, verse number 12. Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Jesus is speaking to his disciples and says, I've got many things that I would want to tell you, but right now you can't receive them. It's too early for you to get them right now. Verse number 12, 13, right? However, when, the, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. And we normally talk about the Holy Spirit will tell you things to come. But in context, what is Jesus talking about? He's saying, I've got many things I want to tell you. But right now you can't. You can't receive them. However, there will come a time when the Holy Spirit comes and he's going to reveal these things. But let's look in verse 14 to see where he's getting them from. 
The Holy Spirit will get these things from home. He says, He will glorify me, for he will take of he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. So Jesus is saying, There are many things I want to tell you, but I'm going to tell you these things when the Holy Spirit comes. Because the Holy Spirit is not going to speak on his own authority. He will take what is he will take it from me and pass it on to you. And this is what we see in the epistles. Amen. When the apostles were now writing these things down, it's because the Holy Spirit was giving them revelation from Jesus. So the epistles are a continuation of Jesus. And the point now is, Jesus is now telling people the things he had always wanted to tell them. In other words, if you just stick to the red letters or focus on the scriptures and gospels, you miss the greater part of the story. Because Jesus says in the Gospels, I haven't told you the whole story. Hold on, there will come a day when I will tell you these things. And now, this is, this is where it's important to study and understand the epistles. And, you know, we talk about in Christ realities. Who we are in Christ, our identity in Christ. And that phrase, you find it in the epistles. Amen? So, let's go and see Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1. Let's see what is being said here. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 1, uh, all right, that's good, we've got enough time. Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 1, let's see. Um, let's see what it says. Hebrews 1, verse number 1. It says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, uh -huh. he has in these last days spoken to us by his son. Now, going back to verse number one, it says God, again, spoke in various times, in various ways, right? To the fathers, to our fathers. Now, he's to not talking about our fathers, you and me, right? Because God did not talk to our fathers, to our ancestors. God spoke to the Israelites' ancestors, amen? He's talking to the Jews here. God spoke to... <laughs> God <laughs> but it's clear, guys. It's simple. That's, it's very clear, guys. God spoke to people like Abraham. God spoke to people like Moses. God spoke to people like David. These are the ancestors, the fathers he's talking about. And he said he spoke to them through what? The prophets. But verse number two then says, now there's a shift. Now he speaks to us through the Son. Can you see that focus? Exactly what Moses said, that one day God is going to raise for you a prophet who is like me you should listen to him everything that he says and we've even seen that even in the epistles it's still him speaking and he says listen to every word that he says so even moses knew these things you know we are discussing with brother isaac on the mount of transfiguration it's the same thing that happened jesus and moses and elijah appeared there you can take it this way, that Moses was representing the law. Elijah was representing the prophets. And when Peter saw that thing, he said, oh, how wonderful this is. Can we quickly build three tabernacles, one for Moses, another one for Elijah, and another one for Jesus? It's almost like saying, oh, man, let's just take, let's just grab the whole Bible as it is, and we just run with it. And it says, while he was speaking, immediately, God broke the silence and says, no, 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 no. That's wrong, Peter. He says, this one is my beloved son in whom I am all pleased. Listen to him. Listen to this one. And when they fell down, when they stood up, for sure Moses and Elijah disappeared. Now we are not saying we throw away the Old Testament, right? But we are saying our focus, like what Pastor Tafara says, if Job, what Job said is contradicting with the reality of the gospel of the new testament then you have to run with what the gospel is saying there was limited revelation in the old testament and again now we know that these things we're trying to point to jesus and now we focus on what jesus has accomplished so anyway let's see so he says in these last days he has spoken to us what through the son and he talks about how he is um how he has uh, appointed him to be heir of all these things Verse number three tells us how Jesus is the exact representation of God. If you come to Keris, you see this. But what we are saying there in verse three is that if you want to know God's true character, you look at Jesus. Yes. 
Amen. Such that the Gospels become very key. Because in the Gospels, not even a single time do we see Jesus killing anyone or putting sickness on anyone. That is the true nature of God. Don't say, but Isaiah said, I create good, I create evil. Uh -uh. Leave that person alone for now. (laughs) Run with what Jesus has revealed to you about God. Amen? (laughs) Now, so I won't go there. My point is in verse number four. Verse number four, he says, so Jesus having become so much better than the angels as he by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So this is the point that is trying to drive across in Hebrews, right? Hebrews chapter 1 is trying to show you that Jesus is greater than angels. You know, I was talking to someone, then someone says, you know what? Hebrews, we used just to run to chapter 11. That's where we would really start reading. Now faith is. But the stuff that was mentioned between chapter 1 to chapter 10 is always right. So, The main point in chapter 1 is that Jesus has become greater than angels. And he then goes on to explain and show you how. So verse number 5 then says, it's showing us how Jesus has become greater than angels. He says, for to which of the angels did he ever say? He's saying, to which of the angels did God ever say these words? You are my son, today I have begotten you. And the answer is none. But the question is, Where did God say those words to Jesus? Now, that is a quotation from Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. Remember, the scriptures were all about him. So in Psalm 2, 7, that is a quotation that God was speaking to Jesus, saying, you are my son, today I have become your father. Then, uh, we are still in verse number 6, I think. We haven't finished verse number 6. So I guess... Oh, sorry, you were trying, oh, you had gone to Psalm 2, okay, okay. Hey, you're going fast. Anyway, <laughs> Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5, right? So, and again, these are words again that God said to Jesus. He said, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And the question is, where did God say these words? Again, these things are in your Bibles. They are the footnotes are there. And this quotation actually comes from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse number 14. Maybe we can see Second Samuel chapter 7, verse number 14. Uh, again, the story, if you read in Second Samuel chapter 7, number 14, the prophet Nathan is talking to David and he says, Look, after you die, God is going to raise one of your sons and he shall establish his kingdom forever. This guy is going to build uh, God a temple. That's from verse number 12. But anyway, verse number 14 then says, I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. So, if you read it at face value, you think he's talking about Solomon. And indeed, he is talking about Solomon, but the scriptures were about Jesus. If you read, it's, it's a, there's a fragment of truth that comes out in that verse. A fragment of truth pointing to Jesus. And it's just the first part of that verse where he says, I will be his father and he shall be my son. So this is the verse that is now quoted in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 5 to show that Jesus became greater than the angels in the sense that he became a son to God. And to none of the angels did God ever say these things. Amen? So if you study it, you can see the dialogue that's happening in Hebrews chapter 1. So Hebrews chapter 1 verse number 6, it then goes to show you what God said to the, about the angels. So to Jesus he said, you are my son, I have become your father. And I shall be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But to the angels, God said, let all the angels of God worship Jesus. And this one is a quotation from Deuteronomy. Again, talking about Jesus is the one being talked of being worshipped there. Then, verse number six, seven, sorry, verse number seven. And to the angels, he also says, he makes the angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. Amen? This is talking about the angels. So the angels are spirits, they are flames of fire. But Jesus, so, so verse number 6 was talking about Jesus. That God said to Jesus, to, he said, let all of the angels worship Jesus. Amen? Now, verse number 8. But to the son, the father says, your throne, O God, 
is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of your kingdom. This is a quotation from Psalm 45. Can you see? He's using the scriptures to show them that this was talking about Jesus. Now, beyond calling him son, he now calls Jesus God. God the Father called Jesus God. Trying to show you that Jesus is greater than angels. And he's got a point. He's going somewhere. Hold on. Verse number 9, he continues with that point that Jesus, I mean, Father calling Jesus God. Let's go to verse number 10. Verse number 10, this is now from Psalm 102. He says, and again the Father said to Jesus, you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. God the Father called Jesus Jehovah. That word Lord is Jehovah. You tell that to the Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> God the Father calls Jesus Jehovah. And he said to Jesus, You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. You were the one in Genesis 1.1, where it says, In the beginning God created. It's Jesus who did that. And here we've got the testimony of the Father saying so. So, in, in short, he's just trying to show us how big Jesus is. He is God. He is any definition of God you have, that's Jesus. Amen? Amen. Now, in chapter 2, he then shows us why this Jesus became a human being. Amen? That's the point. So, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 14, Hebrews 2, verse number 14, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood. Hey, this is not English. Let me read from the NLT. <laughs> Let me read the English for you. You can watch it still okay, but I need to bring it. I want, I want to make it very simple for you guys. Oh, it's there. Oh, they've got the NLT. Hallelujah. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. Why? For only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. <laughs> Amen? So Jesus, who is God, became a human being. Yeah. Right? So that he would die for you and me. Oh, let's hope we get there. Now, verse number 17. This becomes the key. He says, therefore, it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. And this is the main point in this letter to the Hebrews. This issue of the high priest, you don't find it anywhere else in the New Testament except in Hebrews. Why? Because only Jews understood what a priest is. Only Jews could appreciate what a high priest is. And the other the Gentiles could not wrap the, their minds around this point that high priest, what do you mean priest? What do you mean high priest? It's not this priest that you see now and again with the white collar. Uh -uh. We are talking about a real priest. <laughs> so... So the point, the main point in Hebrews is that Jesus has become what? The high priest. Now, walk with me and get this understanding. We are saying from Genesis to Malachi, 39 books. These are people who had studied the scriptures. What conclusion would you give them? What? Yes, they were, the scriptures were talking about Jesus. But how would you represent Jesus to these guys? And to the only letter, or not, yeah, I guess I would say only letter. James seems like it was written to Jews, but for now, this one is clear, it was written to Jews. To this letter written to Jews, Jesus is presented as the high priest. For me, it's like Jesus' most important identity is high priest. And sadly, the church has not really caught that. I'll prove it to you. How many people know a song, or no songs, that, uh, that uh, referred to God as Jairi, Jehovah Jairi. Come on now. I expect more hands. Man. We sang a song this morning. <laughs> Amen? But how many people know songs which talk of Jesus as the high priest? 
uh, I mean, normally we have one or two hands. Come on, this can be... Not even a single hand. Okay, one. One. You see, and even the way she raises, do you know two songs on that? Just one song. Just one, you see. Can you imagine? To the Jews who had the Old Testament, he summarizes the Old Testament by representing Jesus as the high priest. Yet we don't even have songs that we know that represent Jesus as the high priest. Come on, guys. The, I would say the most important identity of Jesus that we find from the Old Testament is high priest. And he knew it. That's why he wrote these things to the Jews. And he explains these things. Now, uh, let's read Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1. It's interesting. Yes, let's stick with the NLT. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1. Thank you. It says, And so, dear brothers and sisters who belong to God and are partners with those called to heaven, think carefully. The King James says, consider. Other versions say, consider carefully about this Jesus whom we declare to be God's messenger and high priest. So he's saying, please take some time to understand what it means for Jesus to be the high priest. And hopefully we'll see it. But do you know what? If Jesus is not high priest, then all of us are not saved. The, the thing is, in the Old Testament, you know, when you understand the New Testament, you read the Old Testament enjoying it now. In the Old Testament, God would show, the Bible calls it, I mean, a number of times, it calls it shadows or pictures or illustration of things that were to come. And God showed us a way that how a human being can be redeemed or how to deal with sin. And in the Old Testament, it, you, you had to have a priest. The priest is the one who would do and present uh, your sacrifice for your sins. And there was a special guy, only one in Israel at the time, called the high priest. And he, did a, 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 he, he, gave, he presented a gift on the day of atonement. And we're saying that pattern that we see is a pattern of the things that God wanted to accomplish. Amen? And we're saying Jesus came and accomplished those things as the real high priest. And we're saying in the Old Testament, I'll just say this, then we'll see it in. In the Old Testament, according to what was in place, only Jews were covered by the priests. Those priests represented only Jews before God. The only way we Gentiles could be represented before God is if a new high priest would come who is not in that order. Amen? Who is not according to that genealogy and that, 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 those laws. And that's where Jesus comes in. And so he's coming into the office of high priest. He has made it available for Gentiles to now be represented before God. Amen? Amen? So anyway, let's look at that from uh, the book of Hebrews. In the past place where I've gone, I've never been able to say this way. So I thought, let me just throw it out there. Hebrews 3 verse 5. Look at what he says about Moses. Hebrews 3 verse number 5. NLT again, it says, Moses was certainly faithful in God's house as a servant. His work was an illustration of the truths God would reveal later. They were truths that God wanted to reveal. They are hidden in the writings of Moses. Amen? And he says these things are going to be revealed later. And that later is in the epistles. So if you don't read the epistles, you won't, you won't get to know these truths that God wanted to reveal later. They now have been revealed, please. Amen? And these are some of the things that Jesus said. I have got many things I want to tell you, but I cannot tell you now. He could have easily said to Peter, I am the new high priest. And Peter would have said, Lord... <laughs> you can't be the high priest. Why? Because according to Numbers 3, anyone, Numbers 3.10, anyone would, okay, only Aaron and his descendants could be priests. And among them, only one could be the high priest. Numbers 3.10 says, if anyone tried to approach that office of priests, stone him, kill him. Appoint Aaron and his sons to carry out the duties of their priesthood. But any unauthorized person, Jesus included, who goes too near the sanctuary must be put to death. 
anyway, let's, let's see. So we want to see how Jesus became what? High priest. And that's the trust of this guy as he's writing this letter. Amen. It's important that we see Jesus as our high priest. So hopefully we'll get there. All right. So Hebrews, let's jump chapter 4. Let's go chapter... All right. No, in chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Chapter 5. I hope you guys are getting something. This is the kind of stuff you get if you come to Keris. If you come to Keris, hey... Your theology will be sorted and you, you will know the truth. Amen? So, thank you. Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 1. Every high priest is a man chosen to represent other people in their dealings with God. Now we are being told what a high priest is. He is a person who, rep who represents the people before God. Mm -hmm. He presents their gifts to God and offers sacrifices for their sins. So the second thing he does is to present what? Gifts for sins. I mean gifts and offerings for sins. Verse number two. And he is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward people. So if you, let's say if it was possible, if you wanted to apply to become a high priest, they would tell you, number one, you are going to be representing the people. Number two, you are going to be offering their gifts for sins, right? And number three, you should be a person who is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward people. Amen? Can you see the caliber of people you are supposed to deal gently with? We're not talking about the churchy, churchy, godly people. No. The ignorant and wayward people. And that is why in Luke chapter 15, verse 1, it says, Luke chapter 15, verse 1, it says, Tax collectors and other notorious sinners. The worst kind of sinners you can think of often came to listen to Jesus. And Jesus did not chase them away. Why? He knew I'm the high priest. I'm supposed to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward people. Amen. Hallelujah. So, anyway, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 2 says, he's supposed to deal with the, I mean, gently, because he also is subject to weaknesses. But Jesus was not subject to them. But definitely we see those three things that you needed in a high priest. Amen? Now, if you read again, you know, one time it will mention a number of things. But it will then give us how also Jesus was appointed as a high priest. Let me read Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 4. Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 4. Yes. And no one can become a high priest simply because he wants to. Such honor, such an honor. He must be called by God for this work, just as Aaron was. And that is why Christ did not honor himself by assuming he could become high priest. I'm telling you, he could have been stoned. He did not just assume to become high priest. No, he was chosen by God who said to him, and we are begging the scriptures. Psalm 2, verse 7. You are my son, today I have become your father. Then verse number 6 then goes on to say, And in another passage, God said to him, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. This is important. Someone asked me, what does it mean, a priest in the order of Melchizedek? It's a contrast from a priest in the order of Aaron or Levi. So he's just trying to show us that Jesus became a priest according to a different order. It's not the same Aaronic priest who did not become a priest because he was a descendant of Aaron. Right? It was because of a different priesthood altogether. So in other words, God changed the priesthood from the Levitical priesthood to a priesthood of Jesus. Now, let's go on to chapter 7 now. We want to see this. Now, chapter 7 is like the key chapter in the sense that if you search, do a word search in the King James, the word priest. So, Again, I told you, you won't find this issue of high priest anywhere in the New Testament. You do find the word priest, not high priest, priest. You find it twice in First Peter chapter 2 and three times in Revelation. And that one is not talking about Jesus. We'll talk about it. It's not talking about Jesus. However, in Hebrews alone, you find the word priest 34 times. And of those 34 times, 15 of those times are in chapter 7. So you can see that the main gist in chapter 7. So let's try to understand chapter 7. Hopefully we'll get to verse 18 that Pastor Tafara wants us to read. 
All right, let's start in verse 11. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11. It says, So if the priesthood of Levi, on which the law was based, could have achieved the perfection God intended, why did God need to establish a different priesthood with a priest in the order of Melchizedek instead of the order of Aaron and Levi and Aaron? It's a question. We know, according to the law, that only descendants of Aaron become priests. But why did God establish another priesthood? In this day, in the first part, he says, if this priesthood could have achieved perfection, it's because it could not achieve perfection. When you go to the scriptures and you try to imitate the things in the scriptures, you will never achieve perfection. <laughs> verse number 12 is key. Verse number 12. And remember, he's writing this to Jews. Custodians of the scriptures and custodians of the law. These are people who revered the law. Listen to what he says in verse 12. And if the priesthood is changed, it's obvious we have seen that the priesthood has changed, right? Because of um, Psalms 110. That quotation which says, The Lord is uh, sworn and he shall not go back. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. It's a quotation from Psalms 110. And the first part of chapter 7 here, he goes on to explain who Melchizedek is. Do you know that Melchizedek appears only in Genesis 14 when he met Abraham? And I know you've heard a lot of sermons about Genesis 14. But then he also mentions, he's also mentioned in Psalms 110. And because of those two portions of scripture, Genesis 14 and Psalms 110, we can establish the priesthood of Jesus. Because Genesis 14 tells us Melchizedek was a high priest. Then Psalms 110 says Jesus was made a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Do you know if we didn't have Genesis 14, or if we didn't have Psalms 110, Jesus, we, we did not have basis to establish Jesus as a high priest. This is the importance. You know, I say Psalms 110 should be one of the most celebrated psalms for the, for the believers. Because that is what made us to become represented before God. That is what gave us a high priest who represents us before God, who offers our sins for sacrifices before God. Amen? So, anyway... Verse number 12 of Hebrews 7. And if the priesthood is changed, the law must also be changed to permit it. What he's saying is, the Levitical priesthood was based on the law of Moses. Right? The law of Moses said only descendants of Aaron can be priests. And one of them would be high priest. But since Psalms 110 shows that there was a new priesthood instituted, it means the law of Moses must also be changed so that we can accept our new high priest. Why? Because if the law of Moses stays, it will disqualify Jesus. The law of Moses says only descendants of Aaron can be priests. So it will disqualify Jesus. So he is telling Jews to say you need to make a decision. Either you are going to stick with the law of Moses and have a Levite as your high priest, or you are going to choose Jesus and accept a new law. These two are not compatible. Yet sometimes you find people who say, Ah, no, Jesus said, I did not come to destroy the law. No. They are reading the Gospels. They haven't gotten to the epistles. Do you know if you read the epistles, if you read Ephesians 2.15. Ephesians 2.15. This one can we go to the King James, the version that Apostle Paul used. Some of you are saying, the Apostle Paul read King James. <laughs> so this one is the new King James. Can we, do you have the original, the KJV without that N? Yes, thank you, sir. It says, Jesus, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain, one new man, so making peace. What he's saying there, he says, Jesus abolished the law in his flesh. Hopefully we'll see there. Anyway, thank you. Let's go back to the NLT. And we are back in Hebrews chapter 7. I'll, I'll show you how he abolished the law. He had to. If he did not abolish the law, he could not become high priest. And Jesus knew what it meant to be high priest. Hallelujah. Thank you. So, now Hebrews chapter 7, right? Verse number 12. We read it. Verse number 13 says, 
For the priest we are talking about belongs to a different tribe whose members have never served at the altar as priests. What I mean is our Lord came from the tribe of Judah and Moses never mentioned priests coming from that tribe. Can you see? So he's saying Moses has to go with this law because we've got a priest that he didn't talk about. Now, verse number 18, Pastor Tafara's favorite one. He says, yes, the old requirement about the priesthood was set aside because it was weak and useless. He's telling the Jews who were holding on to the law and says that thing was weak and useless. For the law never made anything perfect. But now we have confidence in a better hope through which we draw near God. And this phrase is the application of this whole teaching. We have a what? A better hope through which we draw near God. We are saying Jesus became our high priest and he presented a gift for our, secret, our sins that made us acceptable before God so that today we can now draw near God confidently and boldly. All right, Hebrews chapter 8, verse number 1. We need to wrap this one, five minutes. Hebrews number eight, verse number Hebrews eight, verse one. Can you see? Here is the main point. In case you did not get anything to this moment, here is the main point. We have a high priest who sat down in the place of honor beside the throne of the majestic God in heaven. Verse number two. There he ministers in the heavenly tabernacle. The true place of worship that was built by the Lord and not by human hands. He's now rubbing salt to them. He says that temple that you revere so much, it's nothing. It's useless. There is a true place of worship in heaven which was not built by human hands. The one that God built which is in heaven. And that's where Jesus went to offer gifts for sacrifice for our sins. And that gift worked, the guys, eh? Now, uh, <laughs> verse number 7 of chapter 8 says, no, mm, no, uh, verse number 7, I think. Yeah, it says, if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need for a second covenant to replace it. But when God found fault with the people, and this is key, the law is good. The challenge was that people could not keep it. So the fault was with the people. Right, so he says, when God found fault with the people, he said, the day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. The old covenant prophesied its end. God said, I will make a new covenant. And we are going to talk about this. Uh, verse number 13, the very last verse of that chapter says, when God speaks of a new covenant, it means he made the first one obsolete. He made the first one useless. He made the first one out of date. It is now out of date and will soon disappear. By now, the old covenant should have disappeared. I don't know why it's still being practiced in the church. <laughs> Hallelujah. So you find that, you find that, look, guys. Uh, yeah. Oh, man. How do we conclude this one? Let me, let me tell you what the new covenant says. It's a summary of the verses there. Let me give you an illustration. There was a pastor who was, who was transferred to a new church. And when that pastor got there, uh, in the introductions, there was a, 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 an elderly lady called, uh, called Grace who came to him and said, Hi, pastor, my name is Grace. You know, I just wanted to introduce myself and thank you for coming to be our pastor. By the way, I hear God. God speaks to me and I hear him. And says, okay. <laughs> Next Sunday, the pastor came again. And after service, Grace came to introduce herself. And by this time, the pastor wasn't sure. Is she trying to show off? Why is she telling me that she is God? She did that the third time. Next Sunday. And the pastor was agitated. Then he says, okay. If you hear God, I want you to go and ask him to tell you what I did when I was in my third year at seminar. I never told anyone. Nobody knows this, what I did. 
So I want to see if you truly hear God, ask him to reveal to you what I did. And Grace accepted the challenge easily. She says, fine. Next Sunday, the pastor sees Grace is in the crowd. He's now shaking in his boots. But anyway, after church, Grace is there. He tries to delay, but Grace still waits for him. <laughs> then they meet. And he says, okay, pastor. She says, so he says, did God tell you? Then he says, yes, God spoke to me. He says, so what did he say? The answer is profound. Grace said, God told me that. He no longer remembers what you did. God said, he no longer remembers what you did. And it's about time you forget it as well. Verse number 12. Verse number 12 of Hebrews 8. This is the new covenant that God said he was going to make. Right? He says, and I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. This is the new covenant that we are part of. And he's trying to tell Jews to say, guys, can we move away from the old covenant? It has been made useless. Let's enter a new covenant where we've got this high priest who went and offered a perfect sacrifice for us. And today God no longer remembers our sins or our lawless deeds. You know, Hebrews mentions some of the statements that you don't find way elsewhere in the Bible. When he says Jesus went and obtained eternal redemption for us. He's saying Jesus went and he obtained forgiveness of, of, of sins for past, present, and the future ten sins. You know, when I heard this from Andrew first, I thought, mm, this is a bit too much. But that's what the Bible says in Hebrews 9.14, 9.12 if you want to read it. And it says it eight times. That he did it once for all time. Guys, this is the covenant that we are in. Can I just read one verse, then I'm done. Uh, first Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 5. So, the old priesthood has been replaced by the new priesthood. And in this new priesthood, Jesus is the high priest. Then every believer, you and me, have been made priests. Amen? You... You can wear that white, white thing and put your collar upside down and walk in the road. When people say, ah, ah, but Sister Amanda, w w when did you become a priest? You say, it's there in the Bible. Who are you going to believe? Who are you going to believe? Who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe what people say or what God says? So it says, and you... Are living stones that God again can you see we are reading this in the epistles you won't find it in the Old Testament with the Gospels and you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple what's more you are his holy priests you know if you read Leviticus chapter 1 starts by talking of the bent offering chapter 2 talks of the grain offering chapter 3 talks of the peace offering chapter 4 talks of the sin offering and I know in the Bible it can seem heavy but when you know that I am a priest, you enjoy reading that. And guess what? Before, people start collecting money from you. Because I've heard people who have been made to pay a sin offering. In this day and age, sin offering in money. Look, look the offerings. Then I'm done. Through the meditation of Jesus Christ, you, God's priest, offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God or pleasing to God. Amen. So each time we think and meditate and talk about Jesus, you are offering this sacrifice. That's your duty as a priest. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Amen.